this second part of human anatomy videos about the base of the skull, I will try to demonstrate and to address a number of different openings that exist on the base of the skull or floor of the skull through which cranial nerves 1 through 12 will be emerging from the skull including of course some other openings which will be important for either entry or exit point for major blood vessels in and out of the cranial space. So if we just go with the camera screening through anterior, then middle, then the posterior cranial fossae, one can right away notice large number of openings and this is what we're going to decipher in the next couple of minutes. In the first part, we already discussed what is existing here. So this is the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. And as you can see, the light goes through these multiple openings that are seen on both left and right side from a perpendicular plate and cristagalli. These are olfactory foramina. And of course, cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve, will have to send its fibers to pass the cribriform plate and they will enter and terminate within the upper third of the nasal cavity. So that is cranial nerve number one or olfactory nerve. For cranial nerve number two or optic nerve, we need to see the base of the skull a little bit more from a superior as well as posterior direction. It is not a problem for us to identify this depressed area as the pituitary fossa or cella tersica, which is divided from the clivus with its dorsum cellae tersicae. Here are posterior clinoid processes of lesser wings of the sphenoid bone, and in between the clinoid processes and cella tersica, when I move the camera more to the side, you can see this particular opening here, and that is what is called the optic canal. In order to see it a little bit better, I will use a yellow pipe cleaner and I will insert into a right-sided optic canal, just like this. Now we're going to turn the skull from the anterior direction and we will see where optic nerve will show itself within the orbit. This is the right-sided orbit and as you can see I'm able to move the pipe cleaner in or out and that is representing position of optic nerve. Now I will slowly pull it away so we would be able to see the opening and a little bit of light going through in order to confirm that it was truly the optic canal. So that is the opening that allowed cranial nerve number two, optic nerve, to reach the posterior part of the eyeball and to attach to it. We need again to see superior posterior view to the base of the skull in order to better observe this obliquely running fissure that really exists between lesser wings of the sphenoid bone here and greater wings of the sphenoid bone. That particular opening, which also exists on both sides, so you can see it in the form of a comma shaped bilaterally, is known as the superior orbital fissure. Structures, or better to say cranial nerves, which will advance into orbit using the superior orbital fissures, are cranial nerve number three, the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve number four, the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve number six, the abducens nerve. These three nerves, the oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens, are collectively sometimes called the oculomotor nerves because they have a purpose to innervate six different voluntarily controlled muscles that are attached to the eyeball and through highly coordinated activity we are having nerves that are very skillfully moving the eyeball so if we're following with our eyes just a fast moving object we rarely if ever experience presence of double visions or diplopia. Together with these three cranial nerves that are oculomotor through the superior orbital fissure, one more nerve also enters the orbit. That is the first branch of the trigeminal nerve and it is called the ophthalmic nerve. 
so first branch out of three, of Talmic nerve. Of Talmic nerve doesn't have to do anything for innervation of eyeball muscles, but rather passes through the orbit, and once it is out, it will use this opening or notch next to supraorbital margin in order to get out and to wind its terminal branches over the forehead. So for that reason, trigeminal nerve is described as the principal sensory nerve of the face and its first branch, the ophthalmic nerve, passing through supraorbital notch or foramen, practically innervates the skin of the forehead and also would innervate skin of our upper eyelids. From this direction, again, seeing into right orbit, we can see this large opening and, of course, that is the superior orbital fissure. Let's go back into middle cranial fossa and let's find out a few additional openings that are there. We already identified first branch of the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic nerve, to run through the superior orbital fissure. However, additional two branches of the same nerve, the maxillary and the mandibular nerve, need to have their own openings that the sphenoid bone, its greater wing, will generously offer. So openings that we will need to find, again, we need to change the position of the skull a little bit in order to see the opening, which is, again, easiest if I put the yellow pipe cleaner into it on this side. And I have one more pipe cleaner to use the same opening on the other side, but I want you to see it first before the pipe cleaner obstructs the view. That opening here is what is called the foramen rotundum, the round foramen. So yellow and blue pipe cleaners that are inserted into them are representing the second branch of the mandibular nerve, the maxillary nerve, which has exit point from the skull at the opening which is called the foramen rotundum. Third and last and definitely largest branch of the, mandibular, of the trigeminal nerve is the mandibular nerve and the opening which is very easy to identify but I will again place the pipe cleaner into it and then I will remove it. That is foramen ovale. Through foramen ovale mandibular nerve exits the skull and after a short run re-enters the mandible at the mandibular ramus on the inner aspect of the mandible. So far we have mentioned first six cranial nerves and we have successfully identified their openings. Now we'll talk a little bit about some blood vessels as we are still within middle cranial fossa in order to show what is going on. We need to talk about middle meningeal artery and also we need to introduce the entry point for internal carotid artery into the skull.